What's nice about the tactic list, if you can look at these and actually be willing to look for yourself on the list, is really go through and analyze yourself first. And really look at it and go, hmm, which one do I do? Which ones do I do? Sometimes if we know that one doesn't get received, we'll use a different one. And we just kind of change tactics. Um, after you look at yourself, be willing to look at, okay, my family who I live with. Because I was willing to look at, okay, which one do I feel like gets used against me a lot by different people? <laughs> and especially if you are empathetic, like you're a person that has shared, has a lot of empathy for people, you'll find that some people really play on that emotion because you're a very sympathetic, empathetic person. So they really pull on the softness of your heart. Or if you have a servant's heart, people have always told my husband, you have a servant's heart. He would go out of his way to do anything for anybody, okay? But it got to the point where he got used from people because they saw that heart in him and it wasn't always a good thing. And so you have to learn how to say no then too because it can get really bad where, you know, nothing, we should be doing things for each other, but it can get to the point where you have no life and you're not taking, your, your priorities get out of whack. It, you know what I mean? You're not taking care of your family, you're so busy taking care of everyone else. So there's always a balance to everything in life. So we will begin, because I want to begin right on time. Because um, there's so much information with this. So let's open in prayer. Father, I just ask that you would reveal truth to us tonight. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would reveal lies. If there's something that we're believing that's a lie in our life, reveal it to us. Show us what the true truth is and help us to receive that and to apply it into our life, God. Give us wisdom, discernment, and understanding and help us to be better communicators, talkers, and have stronger healthier, godly relationships, Lord. Help us with your power and your might, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. So this is about having healthy communication. And this isn't just about marriage. It kind of starts there because usually the one place that we have the worst problem communicating is our spouse, which is kind of comical. Okay, so you have to put this in the light of comedy for a minute. When you're dating, all you do is talk. And then you get married, and we get stupid. I don't know what is with that. It's like we put the ring on, and we just go. Um, there's that meme out there, and Mark Gunger has said this, that most of marriage is talking to each other from different rooms. And, and that really, really says a lot about communication. But in that communication, we teach our children how to communicate. And then they get married, and they, be, they take on those characteristics into their marriage. And then they wonder why they're struggling. And then, of course, if we don't have healthy marriages, it comes into the church. And it affects how the church talks and how we handle communications and things. And so, again, it really does affect our world. If we're not good communicators, and if you're a boss of a company, and you're running a company, or you're a manager somewhere, and you're not a good communicator... You're always going to be fighting fires, constantly miscommunication, misunderstandings. My dad's back there going. Um, it's, it's a, if you can't communicate well. So what happens is when we looked at these tactics and realized a lot of our communication was emotional based instead of logical thought saying something, it was from our emotions. And what happens is people, we just don't react well. We don't. We just get on this field and we play this soccer game with each other. And this ball is constantly in motion. you got to get off the field. you got to quit playing the game. And then you have to learn how to communicate correctly. There is a correct way of communication. And Jesus kind of gave this to us in Matthew 5.37 when he said, Let your yeses be your yeses and your noes, noes, for whatever more than this is from the evil one. He gave us a blueprint of communication. He told us not to make promises we can't keep. Go back to this chapter and go study it out a little bit. This is his big Sermon on the Mount. We're doing this in the ladies 
Bible study right now. This is the big Sermon on the Mount. He's telling them, don't make vows you can't keep. Don't make promises you can't keep. Don't swear by heaven and hell. Don't swear by your mother's grave. Okay? Don't make, don't talk vainly like that. Be on purpose. Be on point. Let your yeses be your yeses and your noes be your noes. Don't have a pretense behind you or some sub-meaning behind what you say. Let what you say be exactly what you mean. That doesn't mean you have to be crude or crash or rude. It means be honest. We're all supposed to, also supposed to flavor our speech with a little bit of salt, which means something that can heal and flavor and a little bit of grace, right? If it doesn't bring grace to the hearer, should we say it? So this is, a, this is that balance of being honest, but it doesn't mean you have to be rude, okay? So, again, this is balance. So whatever else, when we start trying to manipulate each other to get a response, we're not doing what God wants us to do. It's, it's an evil action, okay? And it has consequences because then our, our relationships aren't really functioning on a godly plane. We're just doing human games with each other. Galatians 1.10, I kind of mentioned the scripture last week, but this is probably the basis, basis of everything. Now, am I trying to win the favor of men or of God? Do I seek to please men? If I were still seeking popularity with men, I should not be a bondservant of Christ the Messiah. If, a lot of times the reason why we manipulate or allow ourselves to be manipulated and we stay in relationships that are like that is because we have a fear of man. We actually have a fear of rejection from people. And so we will put people and what they think and, and their, you know, everything they think about us and their love and all of what we think is love. We will put them on a pedestal above God. And what Galatians is saying is now, Paul's saying to the Galatians, now am I trying to win the favor of men or of God? Who, who am I seeking to favor? Because if I'm seeking to favor God, then ultimately my relationship should be favored by him too. And if someone else has more say in my life than God does, who am I pleasing? them or him. So those are the questions we have to ask ourselves in our relationships. Is there balance where God is still able to be God in my life and Lord? Because often we get into ourselves, even in friendships, you guys. I know as a woman, we desire so much, women do, the connection with other women. We so desire the other friendships. And we need, we need our, and we also want friendships with our kids when they're older. We want, to, we want them close to us. Sometimes to the point, though, where we allow them to manipulate. And we let other women manipulate us. And we allow different things to happen. And that's not healthy, especially if we put God on the sidelines. And, and he's telling us, wait, something's wrong. And we're not listening to him anymore. So it's very important. Listen, this is not about submission. And this is another thing. Everything I was studying out, and I was I really was looking at this from different points of view. In a marriage, often a marriage that has abuse, especially emotional abuse, in the marriage where there's a heavy manipulation, especially if it's male to female manipulation, what will happen is the male often will use scripture like, I'm your husband, so you have to submit to me. Now, you have to go back to the context of these scriptures because it says you're supposed to submit to one another. Also, in the same chapter, it says he's supposed to submit to Jesus Christ and treat you like Christ treats the church. Have you ever seen Jesus manipulate his church? No. He don't do it. God gives us free will. He gives us choices. And in those choices, there's consequences or blessing. But it's still free will. That is not manipulation, because you do it with your kids. Manipulation is when you use an emotional way of trying to get your kids to do what you want them to do. I'm going to show you one tonight that 
every parent has done. Uh -oh. There's no way you have not done it. And, I ha I'm, and I'm saying it, that because you have done it with your children and it was done to you. I can guarantee it. Okay? So, and the truth is we probably all have screamed and all been screamed at. And that was number two. So, you know, it's, it's, these are tactics that we use. Um, submission is not the issue. Um, in fact, submission, we're supposed to submit to God first. And manipulation is not of God. It's actually a sin. And because it's not putting our faith in Jesus Christ, but we're putting our faith in the tactic that we use, we're actually using the manipulative tactics um, to control another person. And this is outside of faith. And so Romans actually 14.23 says, whatever is not in faith is in sin. So if you want to write that down, that's Romans 14.23. Whatsoever is not done in faith is sin. Whatsoever is done without a conviction of its approval by God is sinful. Okay? In the King James it says, whatsoever is not done in faith is sin. All right? So I want you to keep that in mind. Submitting to manipulation actually hinders the person who's doing this from repenting, making a change in their life and really repenting on coming under the Lordship of Christ. And it keeps them from repentance and it confirms their sinful behavior. So submitting to it is not a healthy thing to do at all. So you have to decide not to depend on the manipulation or control of other people. Repent of even allowing the fear of man to control you. I told you last week, I had to get deliverance from that. When we did the Freedom Series with Robert Morris, one of those sessions was on the fear of man. And I sat on that front row sobbing my eyes out because that was me. That's what I needed to get free of. And I'm not talking men. I'm talking the fear of mankind, people. The fear of standing up to someone and saying no. Or the fear of, you know, not being received or being respected. All of those things. They, I just, I dealt with so much fear. And it caused me to be shy, but it also caused me to literally not be able to communicate. And that's not what God wanted me to be able to do. So, again, it held me back. And it held me back from being able to move forward in my life. And also, God wants us to choose healthy, godly relationships. So last week, we actually ended on the sympathy seeker, but I want to go one up. I want to go back to number six. So I'm just going to mention these so we kind of go back through the list. The you should syndrome. And it tells you what the thought process behind it is. Now, remember, I said this last week. You may look at this and go, well, I've done that, but I don't think I thought that. It doesn't always mean that you thought it. It also means that this is how someone is seeing it when it's used against them. Okay? When you're trying to tactically manipulate somebody, they may feel like this even though you're not thinking it that way. So you really do have to admit, well, I didn't realize I was communicating that. That's kind of how I looked at it. I didn't realize I was really speaking that in my, in my behavior, I was speaking this out loud to that person. This is what they were hearing, okay? So that will help. Um, the subtle suggestion, I want to talk about this because I added a part in this. Um, <laughs> God was reminding me of this this week, and he said, ah, oh, you got to explain that one better because there was a piece missing. Subtle guilt is probably the most common thing used, especially with parents. And we get good at it. We know how to guilt our kids into anything. And, and we all do it. It's mom, dad, we all learn how to do it. Especially when our kids get older and they grow up and they leave the house. We learn how to guilt them to come home for the holidays. We learn how to guilt them to do stuff for us. And your kids guilt you. And it's a game that we all play with each other. And women do it to their husbands, and their husbands do it to the wives, and we just, we do this, but we all hate the game. I've heard, I've listened to couples who sit and talk, and this is a very common thing I've heard and lived it too. 
that the woman says, I just hate the fact that his mother can call him at any time and guilt him into coming at any time to do anything for her. There is still literally a cord hooked to those two. And yet, it's the same thing often with her, with her family. There's this guilt game that gets played. And anybody can guilt you into it. So here's the problem with guilt. It's actually a false communication. Because often it's not, you're not really told what they want. You're just kind of talked into it. Have you ever been in a room that somebody talked you into something? They kind of went, uh, so-and-so is going to do this on Friday. Uh, when did I sign up for that? Where's, where's it on my, did I miss the memo? <laughs> That can be a false communication, and it can become a type of a, a, a guilt that you feel like you ha you can't say no. Now, I will tell you, my mom does this. <laughs> now, I'm going to tell you this, too. She does not do it out of, out of manipulation. I just caught her doing it. This is how she does. She's how she communicates. Uh -huh. So this is what I learned. She does not get mad at me if I say no. That's how I know she's not doing out of guilt. That's just her personality. If they're really doing it out of guilt, you saying no is going to tick them off. That's how you know if it's a game. Can you say no is the question. Because my mom will say, hey, you know what? Friday, there's this going on, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, mom, it's not on my calendar. And if you've got to tell me a little bit further in advance, <laughs> I've got other things going on, you know. Let me know. And I'll try to work it in. But, okay, we'll figure that out. Okay. That's just how she communicates. But you know what? She didn't get mad when I said no. She didn't get mad when I argued back and said, wait a minute, wait a minute, when did you say that to me? She doesn't, that's how I know it's not really manipulation. That's just her, okay? Mm -hmm. But when someone's truly trying to manipulate you and guilt you, they can't handle you giving them a boundary. They can't handle you saying no to something. They will always react to the fact that you stood up and said, I can't do that. Or I'm not doing it. That's how you know there's guilt there and there's manipulation. Or they use another tactic on you. Maybe they get mad and they start screaming. Maybe they turn on the tears. Mamas are good at that. But honey, so I have a daughter that hasn't been able to come home for Thanksgiving the past couple of years because she's worked. But the kind of job she has, I understand. Because taking care of a handicapped person myself in my home, somebody needs to work the holidays. It just happens, you know. I understand the kind of job she lives, she works. So we've made, we've figured it out. But I didn't do the whole I could cry over the phone and make her feel guilty for it. And see, that's and that's when you know someone's really manipulating because they're going to go and use another tactic to try and get you to come back on their field and play the game. So the guilt game, one of the things with the guilt game, and I'm going to tell you all this is, this is something God is really starting, he's really dealt with me on this, is what I call sideways communication or in the air talking, okay? I know that most of marriage is talking in other rooms. I get that because we just, especially women, we talk as we go and expect everyone to hear us. Women, stop. You're actually running yourself crazy doing that. One of the reasons why you're so frustrated that your kids never do your, their chores, your husband never takes out the trash, is because you're not communicating right. Stop doing it. You're communicating all wrong. And God got after me and said, you're the problem, not them. Wow. Whew. Smack like a brick. Okay, I'm the problem? Yes, because you're communicating as you're going, and they didn't even hear you. You didn't look them in the eye. You did not communicate with them. And what I realized inside of myself, the truth was, this wasn't busyness. I knew if I sat down with them and told them what I needed, I felt like they wouldn't meet the need. Inside of me was this wound that you won't really do for me all I would do for you. And I had to come to a place where I had to deal with my heart because that was a wound. That was a wound in me. So I had to sit down and be really real with my family. That from now on, when I ask you to do things, I'm going to sit down and look straight in your face 
and let you know this needs to be completed. They got a very different mom after that. And God started doing this to me years ago. This is not even recent. This is like, he started this in the process of being years ago when he told me to quit being God to my kids. Start putting things down in order and saying, hey, this is your chore, now do it. Sit down with them at the table, not communicate in the air. Sit down with my husband and say, I need you to follow through. I need this, this, and this done. That's all I'm asking, those three things. That's it. Okay, where can you fit those in? And be honest and talk back and forth and let him take and give. Same way, this is communication. You're not always in control. And husbands, it's the same way. Some men come home and they just are, they just blow up coming in the door because they're angry at work. What have you been doing all day? Dude, I'm going to tell you right now, that line needs to come out of your vocabulary if you ever want to live. If you don't want her to seriously just go off on you every night, shut up. Don't ever say that ever again. I don't care if you see the evidence of her work. She worked. Just be quiet about it for a minute. Just sit down and talk to her. Ask her how her day went. You might get a kinder version of her. Wow. And women, it's the same thing. Don't hand your honey to-do list to your husband two seconds in the door. Give him a minute to get his shoes off and breathe. Just, you know, if this is about balance, find it with each other. So Matt and I started making these rules. He gets 15 minutes to decompress. And he doesn't get to give me a whole list. Because I get 15 minutes to enjoy the fact he came in the house. <laughs> and for 15 minutes, nothing. He could go and say hi to the kids. He wasn't to give them orders. It made you think differently. Because we took those 15 minutes to come home. How many of you guys come home and you're actually home or you still work? Your brain is still in the car. You're, you know what I mean? This is about thinking about what you're doing. Before you communicate it, think about it. Think twice, speak once. Amen. Just like, uh, you know, my husband always says, when we cut, you know, carpentry, they measure it twice and then they cut once. Because once you cut it, guess what? You can't uncut it. You, it's stuck. You're stuck. And so, again, communication here. Communication is the foundation of relationships. So if it's the foundation and it's going to be the rock of our homes and our lives, we got to get good at this. And as you can tell, the guilt game makes it not good. Because this is what we communicate Building others to respond the way that we want them to. This is actually what guilt does. It tries to get people to respond our way. You guys, that is manipulation 101. And we use guilt. And mamas, we do it really well. Because we say things like, I brought you in this world, I can take you out. <laughs> you know, we got good, we got good memes that come out of our mouth. We got good sayings. Daddies, you do too. Yeah. <laughs> you are supposed to provide my security and make me happy. The thought process here is you ought to meet my needs. And when you don't, you should feel guilty. Now, I, I shared personally, my thought process there was that I honestly believed that if I shared my heart with my family and what I needed, they did not love me as much as I loved them. That was a hard thing to re realize. I was actually not helping them. By doing what I was doing, I wasn't helping them. I was enabling them to not care about me. Instead of asking for them to care and to care about our home. So it was, that was, that was real huge for me. Because that was, like I said, that was an emotional wound. The sympathy seeker. Being intentionally needy, having pity parties, acting hopeless unless a rescuer arrives. I'll be honest, you see this a lot of times with little kids. When they throw themselves on the floor, throwing a fit, often that is just to purely get attention. That is the sympathy seeker. <sighs> 
you know, and they do the whole fainting thing. I would look at him and go, you deserve an Oscar. They would get a little bit of applause from me sometimes. Sometimes I just look at him and go, oh, that's nice. Mama's got things to do. And I just keep going. They would follow me eventually. They're like, she's not paying attention to me. You know. We just got stuff to do. You ever seen the videos? They are on YouTube and they're hysterical. But this little kid is throwing himself on the floor and, every, and his mom's taping him from around the corner. And then she leaves. And so he follows her to the next room and then does it again. <laughs> and I just, I crack it up. I'm like, wow. So you guys, no one has to teach these to us. This is sinful nature. Remember I told you, this is from the root of selfishness. They all come from the root of selfishness. It's not about giving to others, it's about getting. So it's not something we have to be taught. And again, if we're not saying yes and no, it comes from the evil one. That's what Jesus says. So number eight, the silent treatment. This one, I think all husbands and wives have done at some point. We've all done it because it's like easy to do. And of course, I know teenagers don't do this to their parents. Okay. Um, <laughs> pouting, brooding, ignoring, rolls over in bed, locks the doors, walks away, refuses to talk. Now, I'm not talking about saying in the middle of a fight with someone, we need to take a breather. Let's take 15 minutes and go pray in separate places. We'll come back and talk about this sitting at the kitchen table. That's not silent treatment. That's, that's an agreement to take a break and do something and then come back and you better hash it out. Because you're not supposed to go to bed angry, right? We're not supposed to go to bed with something looming over us because we keep an open door for the enemy. So we don't want to do that. So it is okay to set... We're going to come back and talk about this. I think you need to just go cool down. I need to cool down. We'll talk about it in a few minutes. But intentionally choosing to sever communication. Did you know some people have literally lived in silence for days? Uh -huh. Days. Now, a woman lives in silence. Huh? Men, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. If your wife is that silent, you're in real big trouble. <laughs> Because if she'll talk to everybody but you, there's a problem. Yeah. I mean, really. Because women, this no talking thing is not good for us. It's not. We are a pot. We're a pressure cooker. We are. We're a pressure cooker. Now, guys, they're like, they can go to their nothing box and not talk for days. And nothing's wrong. But men, that's not healthy either. Because your wife needs communication from you. Amen. So, again, she'll feel like she's walking on eggshells. And something's wrong and you're like nothing's wrong but you're showing her something's wrong so again communication is important even if you don't think it's important to you kids that don't live at home call your mama once in a while she just sometimes thinks that you are mad at her because you're not communicating when really the truth is you're just really tired and been working and bills to pay and you got really lost in your own world but she thinks what did I do so just call home once in a while. Say, hey, I'm not dead. I'm alive. Everything's fine. We're cool. Okay? Just do that for your mama because that's the way women think. We do. So it, it's just the way we are. So communicate. Um, don't, don't withhold from each other. The thought process in when you're really doing the silent treatment to someone on purpose is if you don't play my way, then you don't get my approval or my communication or me. It's a true cut off of the relationship. And it's very cruel, actually. Do you know one of the things that I've heard very commonly from multiple people that have child wounds is the lack of speech between mom and dad when they would have these silent treatments for days was horrifying to the children. Horrifying. It was the worst eggshell walk they've ever had in their life. They literally lived in fear in the household. And the children themselves learn to never communicate with people because they walk like that all the time. They think everybody behaves that way. You guys, this is not just damaging our marriages. This kind of behavior damages our kids severely and for life. They don't recover and then they think when God isn't talking to them, that he's mad at them. See, parents, how we behave to our children, they're viewing God. 
through us. They are. And so, even if we get mad, if my kids see Matt and I argue, like this happened the other day, <clears throat> all my kids, my hubby and Marlene are home tonight because they've got, I don't want anyone getting sick, they're struggling a little bit with sniffles and stuff. And uh, the other day, we got in a little bit of a tiff, and Marlene had kind of left the room, and I went, and Matt goes, oh. So we went and apologized to her and talked to her and let her know we were fine and everything was good. Because we don't, and it was a tiff tiff. It wasn't anything like we were yelling and screaming. Because um, we, you know, most of the time we don't really fight. We're probably more apt to do this. The silent treatment, I could live in a silent treatment with my husband for a week. That's bad. I could. Because I know this one well. So does he. That's bad, and I watched my kids live on edge. They knew, they, knew it, they knew it was really bad when mom doesn't pray for them when they go to school. That happened once. I got a call because one of my kids knew we had had a fight and didn't, I didn't pray for them before they left the door for school. So they were upset when they got to school because they knew mom was, something was wrong. Silence is not a good thing. It speaks volumes to children. So you have to talk things out. You have to communicate. You cannot play this game because it does more damage than just to you. It does severe damage to those around you. Um, I've also seen this in ministry, and I'm just going to share this real quick. I've seen people be like, well, you hurt me. I'm just not going to talk to you. And they won't, even though you try to reach out and communicate with them, they will not write you back. They will not communicate. You guys, this shouldn't be in us at home, and it shouldn't be in the church. Amen. The Bible talks about come and let us reason together. If you're not willing to meet about it, then you have no right to be offended about it. Amen. Let's be grown-ups. Let's get off the kindergarten game plane and get grown-up here. If we can't talk about our emotions <coughs> and talk about real things and deal with them, then we have absolutely no right to be offended whatsoever. It's called grow up. Paul said, when I was a child, I behaved like a child. When I was an adult, I put away those childish things. This is childish behavior, and it's not correct. But the problem is if we're never corrected by the Holy Spirit to change, then we don't. We think we're doing, it's the only way we know. So I'm not chewing us out because, listen, I say us because this is me. I had to have the Holy Spirit say, Jason, what are you doing? That's not the way I want you to communicate. It's not going to produce godliness in your children. You're just going to produce more of that behavior in them. <laughs> you want to watch manipulation? Literally go down this list and watch it. Just sit in a room full of teenage girls, all my foster kids, years ago. This was my daily routine. From morning to sundown, we lived in Manipulationville. I wish I had had this. I, I didn't have this. I had just the Holy Spirit kind of, no, you shouldn't do it like this, you should do it like this. That's all I had. If I had that list, whew, my house would have been a whole different story. I could have went, did you just do the sympathy seeker on me? I mean, I really could have done some stuff. <laughs> but I could have communicated very differently. You know, all they ever got from me was, knock that off, it's not okay. I didn't know what else to say to them. So don't do the silent treatment. It's detrimental. <coughs> the Grand Slam. So here's my honesty. I've been honest through this whole thing. But here's my real big honesty. This is me. This is me down to my core. So I'm the Grand Slam. I could slam drawers, cupboards, the phone, the doors. And I could damage stuff if I really wanted to. Most of the time, no, because I knew I paid for it, so I was really careful. But one of my foster kids slammed the front door and broke it and broke some of the glass out of the, because we had a stained glass window in there. And I was so mad. I was like, I know you're angry. You can put your fist in, like, on something, but you cannot break things. I was like, you know, I just trying to give him a way to, you know, show he's frustrated, but he can't, don't break things. So this is the Grand Slam. 
And again, you have to be very careful of this. I know that we all get angry and we get frustrated. And you could throw something. I mean, how many people get frustrated with your phone and you say, I would just love to throw this thing? Here's the problem. You pay a bill on it. Do you re you're going to get more angry when you realize you just damaged it. So again, let's get some control of ourselves. The grand slam can be very dangerous, not only to stuff, but again, this kind of goes with the silent treatment. It's the opposite of the silent treatment. You are communicating violence to your children if they're watching, or your grandkids. And so what they see is, just tick me off and watch what happens. And so they walk on eggshells, always afraid they're going to upset you. And so the thought process, process, if you don't meet my expectations, you don't deserve dialogue with me, and I'll make sure that I may let everybody know how I feel. And so this is about showing our frustration, but again, we're not really communicating it nicely or graciously. We're just doing it to control the room. And it makes everybody run away from us. And then we feel guilty. I'm going to tell you, this is how it made me feel. Then I felt guilty because I knew I was wrong, and I would go and repent about it and say, Holy Spirit, help me change. But again, there was a belief inside of me that I believed that if I just told my kids, if I sat down and was honest with my kids that I was frustrated, and this is why I'm frustrated. When you don't follow through with your chores, I'm frustrated because I can't do all this alone. So telling my kids that I really needed, again, was my problem. Again, telling my husband what I needed instead of expecting him to be a mind reader was my problem. My husband getting mad and slamming everything instead of him communicating, really his frustration wasn't me, it was work. He just came home with the frustration, never got his time to get it under control, and took it out on me. So do you see the game? And everybody's in it. And before you've gone to bed, you've already had 600 fights. <laughs> That's just how it feels. And it feels like tomorrow I'll get up and do it all over again. For what reason? Because we're still not communicating with each other and just saying, hey, I had a really crummy day at work. Give me a minute. I want to sit and drink some coffee out on the porch and get my mind together before I do anything. Because I don't want to hand you my frustration. Honey, I need to go in the bathroom and just draw myself a bath and sit there for a minute. Okay. I'm going. Kids, you're on your own. You kill the house, you will be cleaning it before you go to bed. Goodbye. I mean, I just learned to take some, some time and get my brain together before that stuff happened. So I wasn't manipulating people, and I began to speak my needs and what I needed. You know what I found out? The house was starting to get clean. A kid got up in the middle of the night, couldn't sleep, and did the dishes. Weird stuff happened. Weird stuff. I came home, and they were folding laundry. And I was like, are you my children? Is this like invasion of the body, you know, body snatchers or something? It was weird, but it was because I was beginning to communicate, I need your help. This isn't just my house. I need you to pitch in and help. And I'm telling you my frustration because that's where I was at. And it can be all sorts of things. Sometimes it's finances. How well are we at talking about finances with our families and our spouses and our kids? Maybe you got adult kids living outside your home and they're pulling on you. All the time. Their cars are always breaking down. They're always struggling to have rent money. You're going to have to be honest with them and say, look, I have to let you grow up. I love you, but no, I'm going to say no. And when they throw a fit, no, you don't love me. Honey, I want you to see this list. And I'm going to let you know I'm not playing your game. You and me are not going to do this anymore with each other. I'll tell you, I've shown this list to my kids. They've seen it. They know it. They know when mom says something and says, oh, I just did the grand slam. Oh, oh Jesus, help me, Holy Ghost. <laughs> and he does. He helps me. You know what? I don't feel guilt about it anymore. The guilt will put you back in it. You'll just keep doing it. I don't feel guilty. Now I just catch it. I'm like, oh, I don't want to do that. 
the sneer, the curl of the lip, the roll of the eyes, the scowl, the lifts, the eyebrows. I know women, we can do this really well when men turn their eye back and we're like, uh -uh. okay? Teenagers, young adults, you don't think you don't think your parents know when you eye roll at them? Your mama has eyes in the back of her head. She knows when she said something and you went, oh. she heard it and saw it. And men, you think you're getting away with it? No, your women know. They know. You guys, we all do this one at each other. We just kind of like, we make a face. Okay. Sometimes our thought process, if you don't do what I want you to do, you don't deserve my respect. I will be honest, the Holy Spirit got me on this one two years ago and said, that's disrespectful. You don't like what he said, but here's the problem. Did you tell him you didn't like it? No, you just were disrespectful instead. That's not communication either. It's just rude. You don't like, you don't like someone treating you that way? Don't do it to someone else. Simple. Suppressed support. This is another way of kind of, it kind of goes with the silent treatment. You withhold praise, you withhold affection, and you withhold presence. You back up and literally withhold yourself in order to let them know that you're not okay. Now, this does not mean it's not healthy to set a boundary and back up from something that's not good. That's not what this is, okay? There's a difference. This is when you try, to, you try to withhold from somebody in order to get them to come back on your field and play the game with you, okay? The thought press here is process here. If you don't meet my standards, I just won't give you any attention, okay? That's, this doesn't mean that you don't, if you've got a relationship with somebody and they're always trying to start an argument with you, they've always got a fight, they've always got a nasty word to say to you, that doesn't mean that you can't back up and choose not to communicate with them. That's right. <laughs> That's a boundary, okay? But this is someone in your life like your husband, your wife, your kids. You should never withhold praise from your kids because you're mad at them. You should not withhold affection from your spouse because you're angry with them. It's hard, I'll tell you, because when you're angry with somebody... You don't want to touch them. You don't want to praise them. You're angry with your husband and he comes home and he does something off the honey to-do list that you have for him. And you know then you have to praise him for what he did even though you're still mad at him from the argument the night before. But you withhold praise from him. He won't do that honey to-do list next time. You see what happens? So you have actually hurt yourself. And you should never withhold praise from your children. Listen, if you don't praise your kids, the world's going to do it for you. And they're going to do it all wrong. Someone's going to praise them and get their heart. And it ain't going to be who you like. You should not withhold praise from your children because you're angry. So we have to be careful that we're not withholding what the other person needs just because we're frustrated. Deal with your frustration, but don't withhold something from them. The stall. Intentionally slow. I see this one. I've seen this one so many times. <laughs> when somebody doesn't want to go somewhere and they intentionally slow down to make you late. Or they're always late to everything. Now, I'm not saying that if you're a person that's just always late, it happens. But it can be a manipulation tactic. You have to, and again, you have to judge your own heart, you guys. Listen, no one can judge you. You have to look at your own heart with the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, am I doing this? And it's manipulation. They can they correct me. Um, you're intentionally slowing down. Okay, I have seen this one. You know, honestly, if you really don't want to go somewhere and your spouse is excited about going, you can drag your feet real easy and make them late. They want to go and they're really excited about it, but you're not. Like, the girls want to go on a shopping trip and their husband's going, really? I'll just drag myself behind and maybe they'll quit. That is manipulation. That's what it is. And our kids do it. When mom and dad want to go, we got to get going, we got to go to church. And the kids do this, but I'm sick. Oh, I can't go. 
you know? And I remember the old days, throw up and prove it. Yeah. And they, then they, they would gag themselves and try to, you know, oh, don't you feel better? Let's go to church. It was kind of one of those things. But, and I'm not saying you shouldn't pay attention to your kids. My kids weren't feeling good, and I said, stay home. I don't need you doing that in front of people. Blow your nose at home, take your meds, go to bed. Okay? There is a time for that. But there's also a time they play a lot of games. Okay? And you got to know the difference. So, someone always forgetting. Husbands, do not forget your anniversary. That's a bad thing. <laughs> Women don't usually forget. Most of the time. So, but don't do it intentionally, especially. Okay? The thought process, process can be... If you don't let me control you, I'll get control in other ways. I'll just make you late to everything. To, the, to people who have lived in, under this kind of control, they can recognize usually when this is a tactic versus just kind of, that's just your personality. You know what I mean? Um, they can really tell because I'm telling you, there is a cruelness behind it when this is done to you and it's a type of control and manipulation. And a couple of you guys are nodding your head at me only because I know you went through it. So the sniveling sobber, someone who can literally time their tears, the little kid that can throw themselves into a full-blown fit on the ground and cry instantly. You didn't touch them or poke them and they can instantly turn on the tears like someone's killing them. Um, subtle sniffles. I'll just go by myself. <laughs> Come on. Um, extended crying. Somebody who literally just extends the tears. They'll cry and wail and cry and wail until they get what they want. If you don't meet my emotional needs, I will fall apart. Right here in front of you. And the sigh. We often do this one and don't even catch it. <sighs> Too often. We sigh, we grunt, we groan, or we make a noise. But it's not language, and yet it speaks. You guys, it speaks volumes. It speaks our frustration. One that I used to use, and it's on here, was I used to bite my lip when I was really upset. I kind of pierced my lips together. Because it was my way of holding my tongue. Well, let me tell you, my kids knew when mom was ticked. In fact, one of my daughters used to say, you're doing that lip thing. You are mad. <laughs> She'd call me on the carpet about it. You think your kids don't know your tells? Oh, yeah. You're not that good of a poker player. Your kids know your tells. They really do. And they know when, when you're angry. It's better for you just to communicate. I'm not pleased. That really does upset me. And this is why it makes me upset. It'd be better for, for you just to communicate. But do you know why we often don't communicate? And this is really what the Holy Spirit kept showing me through all of the past 10 years of my life. It's because the truth is I didn't believe I deserved to be heard. Inside of myself, I still had those inner wounds that I didn't believe I deserved to be heard. And I didn't believe that my family would respond the way I needed them to. Because inside, I wasn't sure if they really loved me the way I loved them. And the problem was, I wasn't giving them a chance. I wasn't being fair to them. So I had to deal with my wound in private with the Holy Spirit. But then I had to go and sit and communicate to them that Mama needed them. And I needed them to step up to the plate. I had to go to my husband and, and tell him, I need you to step up to the plate. I didn't know you needed that. I know you didn't, but I didn't know how to say it. Till now. And I wasn't rude about it. I wasn't, you don't do this for me, and it's your fault. Listen, if you start a conversation with your finger pointing and you, you already blew the conversation. Don't use the word you. Say, when this happens, I get frustrated. Try to change your verbiage. Even your kids, because they'll instantly get defensive. If you have to go and talk to somebody at work about a situation, don't walk up to the person and say, you did this, and I'm ticked at you. Your conversation was ended the minute you said you because of what you just said. You need to say, hey, this happened yesterday and it frustrated me. Can we talk about it? Nowhere in that conversation did I say the word you. And I kept it light. And can we talk about this? 
and let them be frustrated too. <sighs> you know? Let them have an emotion. Let them say something. Don't take it personal. And if they do use the word you, just look at them and say, you know what? I'm not even going to get defensive. Let's, let's not do that. But let's just talk about the situation. Make it not a personal attack. Because that's not what it's about. Let's come to an agreement. If we can be in what, what is more beautiful than brothers being together in unity and harmony? That's what the word says. There's nothing more beautiful than harmony and unity. And if we can learn to communicate at home, and our marriages can get healthy, and our kids, and then we can learn to communicate in our work, and we can learn to communicate in the church. Do you know how many church splits have started over stupid communication, and most of it would be cured by this? Because mm -hmm. we just got upset, but didn't know how to say it. Do you know how many things could have been cured from a simple conversation? And instead we did the stall and just decided to ignore each other. Oh, it'll go away. Problems never go away. They're like dirt underneath a rug. Jesus didn't come to bring peace, you guys. He came to bring a sword. Mm, that's one of those scriptures. He came to bring a sword. So I'm going to look it up so I give you guys... Where it's, it's right found. Here. It's right there. You got it? Matthew 10, 34. Jesus came to bring a sword. Do you know what sword he's talking about? The word. He's talking about the sword of the word of God that def defines and it separates. And it shows the truth and the lie. Mm -hmm. And it exposes it. It's the sword that does surgery, that two-edged sword we've talked about, that comes in and separates what's harming us from what's good for us. That's what he's talking about. He didn't come to bring, he's not talking about peace. He is the Prince of Peace. He's talking about, I didn't come to bring the kind of peace that you think where everything's perfectly still and there's no problems. Peace is not the absence of conflict. Peace is when you've dealt with the conflict and you've worked through them. You work through your storms. You work through things. The fear of man brings a snare. Here's one of the other verses. Proverbs 29, 25, if you want to write this down on your paper. The fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. The reason why we often don't want to deal with a conflict is because the truth is we're afraid of people. We're afraid of their rejection. We're afraid of what they might say. Really and truly, we're afraid, and so we don't really want to confront things. Now, there is a time to confront if you're not in a safe position, and I say this very carefully because, again, some people have dealt with really extreme situations that are abusive where it can escalate to abuse physically. Then you should never confront the person alone. I don't believe you should have to put yourself, and actually that goes back to Matthew. Matthew 18, if you can confront your brother in private and do it privately and they receive it, then do it privately. But if they won't receive it and you've already tried, you're to bring it up. <coughs> That's biblical. And so you're not to put yourself in a position of harm. So if that's something that you have to do, then you need to do it with another person. That is biblical. That's in Matthew 18. If you want to look that up. So this truly comes down to are we letting God be our Lord? Are we letting Jesus be our Lord? Again, I just want to remind you, if you feel like you're being manipulated, there is always, anger is always one of the emotions from it. It always is. That you're just angry but don't know why. And if you're manipulating people, of course, you probably have a lot of anger too because you're living in that and you're not happy with yourself. Actually, I found a lot of shame in me. That's what I found. My anger was because I was ashamed. I wanted to change and didn't know how to change. I wanted to change my behavior and didn't know how. And simply, I needed the Holy Spirit to show me a different way to do it. Oh, I could communicate. I can ask. I can, you know. And it, listen, it took time. Because I can't say that I was all healthy and I can't say my husband was either. It took time for us to get to a place where we were. And sometimes we had to go to counseling with another person so we could have someone kind of sit between the communication and help us communicate better because we weren't good communicators. 
That helped. You know the other thing that helped? Taking my kids to counseling. When I, had, when I was a foster parent and had to take my kids to counseling every week, I learned a lot from their counseling sessions. I sat there and gleaned. We have this amazing tool. We, I didn't have 20 years ago when I was youth pastoring, and it's called Google. And there's amazing ministers who put stuff out there for free. And because they want people, they want to bless people, and they want to help people heal. So there's amazing things that you can learn. Just And you have to be careful. Yes, there's always weirdness out there, okay? You have to look at the, what's, what does the word say. I loved some of the notes I got from one of the guys because he instantly went to the scripture. He said, this is a fear of man issue. And I went, ooh, I like you. What he just hit, the, he literally hit the <coughs> right on the nose. He just hit it. This is a fear of man problem because you're forgetting who is God in your life. And I thought that was powerful. And often we excuse actions. We excuse actions and allow people, well, that doesn't bother me. We, we make excuses. <coughs> and those that are being controlled often feel like they're in a performance-based acceptance. They lose their independence because they're, so, they're not allowed to do anything on their own. And they end up in an identity crisis where they don't know who they are. See, God doesn't want us to be like that, you guys. He created us to know who we are in Him. And He wants us to follow the Holy Spirit. He's our guide. He's our teacher. He's our leader. Other people are people that come along. We're supposed to be brothers and sisters in Christ. Moms and dads, I want to challenge you something with your older children. And we're using this. I'm starting this with Marlena. Because... She's about to graduate this coming year. And she's working more, and she's outside the house more. And so I'm starting, even though she's in my home, I'm starting this a little bit different with her because I have a knowledge I didn't have. But I've started using it with some of my older kids. And that's when your kids get old enough to be full-blown adults. You're not to treat them like they're your children anymore. If you are spiritual, if you are saved, you need to know this. That kid of yours is to be treated like a brother or sister in Christ. And I thought that was incredibly powerful to hear Robert Morris talking about that. He gives respect to his older kids, especially when they move outside of his home and they have their own families. Now, I'm not... With Marlene, I'm doing just a little bit of this because she's still in my home. She still has chores. But when she has worked at 1 o'clock in the morning and then gone to school and came home, she will not have a chore that night. And all the parents probably went, what? Yeah. yeah. Okay. She ain't going to have one. Nope. That's fairly fair. Most of the time she ends up making her own dinner and goes to bed on her own schedule. I think that's incredibly fair. And that's only a couple nights a week. It takes the burden off of her. And listen, and that is our job as a parent is to let our kids grow up. Yeah. And not keep a burden on them they cannot keep. I wish I had known that when I was younger. Because we were always taught your kids have to have a chore. That's not responsible of them. Really? Really. Now I'm not saying I don't ask her. I, she's come home and I've said, hey... Can you help me tonight before you go to bed? Yeah, Mom, I can do that. But I don't expect it of her. And I've let her say yes, and I've let her say no. No, Mom, I'm really not feeling well. i got to go straight to bed. And go to bed. I'll have Ben help me. And you know what? Ben doesn't complain. He doesn't look at me and say, but that's my lady. She's getting away with everything. He looks at me and says, hmm, she got up at 1 in the morning and worked this morning. I'll do it. This is part of communicating and being part of a family. And so I'm being very raw with you that we're implementing this already because I'm trying to get my kids to realize there is a point where I have to quit being the mom and teach them to grow up a little bit and start to do on their own. It's a respect thing. If you want respect, give it. Give it. You want people to not manipulate you? Get off the get field with them and don't manipulate back. And don't manipulate to get your way. Talk and communicate.
Okay. We're going to close in prayer. And I'm just going to let my dad go ahead and play this song as we close out. I hope you guys learned from this like we did. I, I learned so much. And like I said, I pray that you can take this home and really apply it to your life. You apply it how you need to. Let the Holy Spirit show it to you. Okay? This is an individual walk. Apply it to your family. After you've done this for yourself, then sit, sit down with your spouse. This is my assignment to you. Sit down and do it on your own for just you. Each of you, if you're married. And then come together and talk about, maybe the wife feels like you manipulate like this, but you don't see it that way. But be willing and open to talk about it. You may not even realize you do some of those things. Both of you. And then when you've talked about it, you'd be surprised how much you talk about it. Because it'll become a part of your conversation for the next week. And then after you've really begun to implement it, your kids, my kids actually came to us and said, what happened to you two? Because we got weird. Like, just not normal. We just got very different about things. And then I caught some stuff in my kids. And I sat one of them down and said, do you realize you just did this to me? Well, I don't know. I said, I'm going to show you something. And then I sat them down and had this little conversation with them. So it became a part of something we could talk about then. But we had to implement it first as mom and dad in our home. So if you're single, think about, you know, after yourself, think about maybe some of the relationships and friendships you might have. Or do those fit in there? You know, think about that. Think about how we communicate with each other in church. This is what this is for. So let's see what the Holy Spirit gives us in the wisdom. I believe he's going to make us better communicators. I want us to be a strong church and have strong families and strong homes and communicate really well and, and be healthy emotionally. I think God wants us this because it prospers us in our minds and our emotions. He doesn't want us flipping out on our feelings all the time. Our feelings aren't what we live by. We're supposed to live by faith, right? So that we can't have our emotions all out of whack. <laughs> Father, I thank you for tonight, and I thank you for everybody here. Bless them. Keep them safe. Father, I thank you for health and wholeness in our bodies. I rebuke all viruses that have come against our kids at school. I take authority over colds and, and all the viruses and all the respiratory. In Jesus' name, and I speak healing over their bodies. In Jesus' name, and over our homes. Father God, we claim, Psalms 91, that no pestilence and no plague come nigh our dwelling. I thank you for health and wholeness on our bodies. Thank you for health and wholeness in our marriages. Help us to communicate well with each other as husband and wife. Help us to be good communicators to our children and our grandchildren and our friends and each other in the church. Help us to be brothers and sisters in Christ and not to be abusive with each other. Help us, Father. If there's a wound in us, heal the wound. Expose it, Holy Spirit. Show us why we struggle with something or why we believe something. Show us the lie and show us the truth and help us to walk in the truth, God. Father, I thank you for everybody here. Bless them. In Jesus' name.